Well, good evening to the Home Improvement Conference. I'm so glad that you've tuned in tonight, and we're going to be discussing a very important subject. Last night here in Virginia, uh, at the time of this recording, it got down to 30 degrees. By the end of the week, it's supposed to be 80 to 85 degrees. So between the pollen and the temperature change, uh, I'm having an issue with my uh, throat, but I trust that uh, it'll be understandable and you can be helped and blessed. Now, tonight we're going to be talking about a happy home is where family members reconcile quickly. A happy home is where family members reconcile quickly. It corresponds with chapter 12 in your booklet, chapter 12, called Resolve Conflicts Quickly, and it will be following very closely uh, to that outline given there in the book. So I hope that you're ready to go this evening. Let's have a moment of prayer and ask God to help us, talk to us, and minister grace to our hearts. Can we pray together for just a moment? Now in the quietness of your home and your own heart, just give God permission to speak to you. Just take a moment. <clears throat> give God permission to speak to your heart. Father, thank you that you are God, and Lord, you've given us your word to tell us how to get along and how to get reconciled quickly. So, Father, tonight, may your hand be upon the message, and Father, our hearts are open to be instructed by you, your word, and your spirit. We give you praise with anticipation because we ask in Jesus' name, amen, amen. Well, there was a man speeding down the highway doing 100 mile an hour. There was a policeman chasing him, and finally the man pulled over. The policeman got out of the car, and he said to the fellow, he said, Look, um, I was trying to stop you to let you know your tail light was out. So why were you trying to escape? Why were you trying to get away? And the man in the car, he said, Well, last week, my wife ran off with the policeman, and I was afraid you're trying to bring her back. Now, that's a sad commentary right there. Uh, but you know the truth is not everybody in every home is getting along all the time. Two soldiers went off to war. One went off to fight for his country, and the other one went away to get away from his wife. And the latter wrote his wife a letter, and he said, Would you please stop writing me so I can fight this war in peace? So I can fight this war in peace. Boy, I'll tell you what. You know, before marriage, opposites attract. Before marriage, opposites attract, but after marriages, after marriage, uh, opposites irritate. Before marriage, you have disagreements, but after marriage, you have fights. I think it was Leonard Ravenhill that said, when two people stand at the marriage altar, there's actually six people standing there. There's actually six people standing there. Number one, the there's the person she thinks she is, the person the bride thinks she is. Then there's the person that the groom, he thinks she is. And then there's the person she really is. When they're standing at the marriage altar, there's also the person that she thinks he is. And there's the person that he thinks he is. And then there's the person that he really is. And you know, when you get married, four of those people uh, evaporate on the spot, and you're left with two people, the person that he really is and the person she really is. Now, somebody said there's four stages to married life, four stages to married life. There's romance, then there's the reality stage, then there's the regression stage. And then there's the rebuilding stage. And you know, rebuilding requires reconciliation. Reconciliation is all about conflict resolution. It's all about peacekeeping in the home. You know what a perfect home is? A perfect home is a place where imperfect people are honest about their imperfections and they work at clearing the air. That's what, a, that's what a perfect home is, where imperfect people are honest about their imperfections and they work at maintaining peace. So we want to talk about uh, how to reconcile quickly. Now, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 26, what a tremendous verse. It says, be ye angry and sin not. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Now listen to this. The word angry means exasperated. It means enraged or outraged. And the Bible says, don't let the sun go down on your rage. In other words, resolve your conflicts quickly. Deal with your disagreements. 
I was talking to attorney David Gibbs, and he told me the story of a group of convention Baptists who approached uh, a leader of the non-affiliated Baptist, and here's what they wanted to talk about. These fellows said, we perceive that in our churches, we're losing 93% of our children to the world when they graduate from high school. We're, we perceive we're losing 93%, but we calculate and perceive that you and your group, you're only losing 73% of your children to the world. And they had come to a, approach a man who they thought had a 75% failure rate to get advice. Now, brethren, uh, when we're consulting somebody that we think has a 75% failure rate, then the situation is serious and dire indeed. And you know, the truth of the matter is a lot of kids, a lot of children will jump ship. They will walk away from the faith. And I wonder, I wonder how much of this is due to friction and unresolved conflict in the home. So if we're going to have a happy home, we're going to have to learn how to resolve conflict. So I want to give you eight guidelines, eight scriptural guidelines that will help us to resolve conflicts very quickly. You know, strong families don't just happen. They must be built. Strong families don't just happen. They must be built. And if we're going to build a, a, a a strong family, we have to build on the right foundation, and we have to learn the practical keys from the Bible on how to get reconciled quickly. So let me give you uh, these guidelines. Number one, be honest. Number one, be honest. Now the Bible says in verse 25, it says, wherefore put away lying, put away lying, speak every man truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Put away lying, speak truth, uh, commit to being honest, to being authentic, commit to being transparent. How often does one spouse say to the other, okay, what's wrong? And the other party says, nothing. And uh, about two minutes later, that, that, that spouse will unleash a barrage of anger, resentment, and hurt. You know why? Because of the lack of honest communication. Now, look, we not only need family devotions, we need devoted families, families who are devoted to authenticity, to transparency, to reality, and to uh, total honesty. Now, the scripture says that we're to be honest, we're to tell the truth, we're to speak the truth in love. And you know, honesty is the only way to develop a meaningful relationship. You can develop a meaningful relationship with the Lord or with another human being apart from transparency and honesty. Now, I heard, uh, heard this one time about the five levels of communication, the five levels of communication. Now, listen to these. Level number one is the cliche level of communication, the cliche level. It's surface communication, stuff like, hey, it's a beautiful day. Boy, it is, it's, it's hot outside. And this kind of communication offers nothing of substance and expects nothing in return. It's the cliche level of communication. Level number two is the information level, the information level. And this is all about facts and figures. Stuff like, hey, what's for dinner? Hey, what time is Billy's ball game? Uh, when is the office party? It's an information level. It's a little different from cliche, but not a whole lot. It's the information level. It's all about facts and figures. Level number three of communication is the I think level, the I think level of communication. Now, this is about ideas and opinions. It, it's, more, it's more than the calendar and the calculator. It's the I think level of communication. It's like, uh, hey, where do you want to go for dinner tonight? Uh, where should we go on vacation? You know, relationships that develop, develop no further than level three are really just acquaintances. There's no real deep uh, fellowship and oneness of heart and soul. So there's the I think level of communication. And then there's the uh, level number four, the I feel level of communication. I feel. This is talking about values and feelings. This is speaking to what really motivates us. It's what I really care about. 
It's stuff like when what a spouse or a family member would say to another a family member, well, I feel we need to get more involved at church. It's coming from the heart. It's a heart level. It's a deeper level of communication. But the ultimate level of communication is level number five, and that's the I am level of communication. The I am level of communication. It's, it's, it's all about reality, honesty, and being authentic. It's when we take the mask off. It's when we get real with God and get real with one another and we move beyond surface level communication. I heard Les Olala say one time that most people never get beyond level two communication. Can you imagine living for 70 years and never getting down to heart level, I am level communication? When my wife and I got married, I ne I've never had a problem talking, but my wife was a quiet person. So we decided that we would spend 30 minutes a day communicating one to the other. Now we traveled in evangelistic work, so we had plenty of time uh, traveling down the highway. And one day it was my responsibility to lead in communication on any, uh, any topic I chose. And then the next day it was her responsibility uh, to lead in a 30 minute uh, uh, conversation, communicating. We, I knew we had to learn to communicate to one another early on, or because if we didn't, we probably never would. Now, I believe it's never too late to start communicating from your heart. And, you know, as we grow in the Lord, we need to grow in our integrity and in our honesty. Now, sometimes in our home, we have family meetings, family, what I call a family meeting, uh, about eight or nine years ago, I felt compelled to call my children and grandchildren in, and we had a family meeting. And I just felt compelled to ask them this question. Do you feel you're spiritually prepared for any type of crisis that might occur? I just asked them, I said, do you feel like that you're prepared should some crisis emerge? I felt in my heart I should just address this and talk to them. I had no idea. But come to find out, uh, I had cancer and didn't know it, and that soon would be revealed after this family meeting. Now, sometimes you, when you feel compelled of the Lord, you just need to have a family get-together, a fam what I call a family meeting. I felt impressed on another occasion to call my family in, and I asked them this question. I said, when was the last time you heard a Bible message on the subject of hope? When was the last time you heard a Bible message on the subject of hope? And they thought and thought, and they couldn't ever recall hearing a message dedicated to this great virtue called hope. And you know, sometimes as uh, the head of your household, you just get a burden, a compulsion upon your heart. I want to encourage you to uh, follow up on that and have seasons of open, honest communication. Now, I don't think that uh, we ought to micromanage our grown children and their families. I, I don't believe in that. But you can still shepherd your family, uh, no matter how old they are. I know a man in New Jersey, he's 91 years old, and for over 31 years, he's had a monthly family meeting. And then the children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren, spouses, anybody who can and wants to, once a month come to his house and they have a family meeting. Wow, what a patriarch. And I believe that that kind of communication will establish a tremendous integrity and a legacy in the home. Now, intimacy requires honesty. Intimacy requires honesty. And can I encourage you to have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with your spouse on occasion? Have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with your children. Have a heart-to-heart -heart talk with your grandchildren. Shepherding your family requires honesty. And I want to tell you, nothing will ever get resolved apart from honesty. And that's why the Bible says that we're to be honest. But number two, to resolve conflicts quickly, we have to learn to control our anger. Learn to control your anger. Look at verse 26 in your Bible. What does it say? Be angry. Be angry and sin not. 
Now, the Bible doesn't say, don't get angry. The Bible says, don't stay angry. Be angry, but don't sin. The Bible says, harsh words stir up anger, but a gentle word causes strife to cease. You know, habitual anger is a learned behavior. You ever get around somebody that just blows up all the time? That's a learned behavior. And if you can learn a wrong behavior, you can, uh, you can learn a right behavior. So uh, control your words and control your anger. Control your words and control your anger. You need to be careful about what you allow yourself to speak because you can stir yourself up uh, by the words you employ. And if you want to get something out of your mind, first get it out of your mouth. If you want to get something out of your mind, first of all, get it out of your mouth. In other words, watch your words. Be angry, but don't sin. Now listen, don't exaggerate the situation. Don't use exaggerated speech. Stuff like, you never hang up your clothes. And the guy's thinking, yeah, I, I remember doing that one time. Don't, don't use this exaggerated speech. You never hang up uh, your clothes. You're, you're, you're always late. Well, you're probably not always, but maybe most of the time. So don't use this exaggerated type of speech. Now, you don't have to say everything you think or feel. You don't have to say everything you think or feel. The Bible says a fool uttereth all his mind. A fool utters all his mind. I was in the first grade and a public school and the second graders were putting on a play. Well, they got up there and put on this play. I was, a, I was the, the, the last born in my home. Uh, I didn't know much about controlling my speech. I pretty much said what I thought. And after they had finished this play, the second graders, I just happened to mention to one of them, I said this, you know, that's the worst, worst play I think I've ever seen in my entire life. Now, I wasn't trying to be hateful. I was just uh, telling them what I thought. Well, uh, that second grader went to the, her, her teacher and told her what I had said. And that teacher told my teacher, and my teacher told me that what I said was inappropriate. And I learned right then, you don't have to say, and you shouldn't say everything you think or everything uh, you feel. A fool utters all his mind. So don't speak everything you think. That's why the psalmist said, I'll put a watch, O Lord, over my mouth. God put a, door, put a guard at the door of my lips. Now, listen, be angry and sin not. You know what that means? Don't direct your anger toward people but rather direct your anger toward the problem. Because it says in Proverbs, a brother offended is harder to be won than a strong city, and their contentions are like the bars of a, council, a castle. Listen, a, a brother offended is very difficult to reach, and when we say things, and when our anger explodes on people, and we unload on people, uh, we erect barriers in relationship and in communication. So if we're gonna resolve quick uh, relationships quickly, then we have to learn to control our anger. Number three. Uh, to reconcile quickly, you need to determine the right time to deal with problems. Determine the right timing to deal with problems. Now, verse 26 says, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Look at that. Don't let the sun go down upon uh, your wrath. Handle disagreements quickly. Learn to use wisdom and handle disagreements at the proper time. Now, don't try to solve things when you're tired because your perspective and your mood is uh, not right. Don't try to solve things just before you go to bed. That's probably not the best time. But deal with problems at the appropriate time. And often, uh, the appropriate time is the moment when the things go wrong. And don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. But sometimes, especially with past situations, uh, we need to use wisdom uh, and timing to confront and talk about situations. Remember in 2 Samuel how David had committed adultery with Bathsheba? And he had gone for probably a year, they say. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. And, and it might have been a year later. But Nathan the prophet waited for the right facts, and he waited for the right time, and then he confronted David with that story.
So don't rush like a bull into the china shop and, 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 and just try to, try to, try to just uh, be so impulsive about situations. I, I have a friend, he, he came to the Lord, he got born again, he got converted, he got saved. But buddy, he went home and he, he laid down the law, he poured out the liquor, him and his wife had been drinking for the longest kind of time. And he uh, made some radical decisions with no concern to bring his wife along with him. And she left him. She divorced him. And you know, the lesson here is learn to discern God's timing. Use God's wisdom. And, and, and if it's possible, if something happens today, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. But if it's been a matter that happened a long time ago, you might want to use God's wisdom and discern God's timing uh, when you confront those situations to seek to put things right. Rule number four, to uh, re reconcile relationships quickly in the home, be committed to a creative alternative be committed to a creative alternative. The Bible says in verse 28, look at what it says. It says, let him that stole steal no more. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather uh, let him uh, do that working with his hands, that which is good. So the text here is saying, stop stealing and start working. Look for a creative alternative. Now, you've got to replace the negative with the positive. And uh, I think it was Jim Benny that talked about three keys to lasting change. Three keys to lasting change. In Ephesians chapter 4, the scripture says that you put off the former conversation concerning the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Put off the old man, verse 23, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, verse 24, and that you put on the new man. So there's three keys for lasting change. Repent, renew, and replace. Three keys for lasting change. Repent, verse 23, put off the old man. Verse 23, uh, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And verse 24, replace, put on the new man. It's the replacement principle. You know, when you put off something, you need to put on something. Uh, when you drop stop something, you need to start something. Uh, when you drop something, you need to begin something. So what are we to put off? Well, put off pride and put on humility. Put off hardness of heart and put on tenderness of heart. Put off hopelessness and put on faith. I mean, put off despair and put, all, put on expectation. Now, you know, Life is about putting off and putting on and getting renewed in the spirit of our minds. Now, the main thing we ought to put off as Christians is the old man. It's the self-life. It's the flesh. If you want to know what the flesh uh, is in the Bible, there's a physical body, but then there's this fleshly nature. Take the word flesh, knock the H off, and spell it backwards. S-E-L-F. Now, there you have an apt description of of the flesh. It's the self-life. It's that self-centered disposition. But Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Not I, but Christ. Put off the big I, put on Christ. Put off the old self. Put on uh, the new, new creature created in Christ Jesus. Put off that old nature. Put on the new is what he's talking about. So in our text, uh, the apostle was instructing the Ephesian Christians to not only stop stealing, but to get a job and look for opportunities to meet somebody else's needs. In other words, be open to a creative alternative. And I want to tell you that in marriage and in the home, you've got to look for creative alternatives. We need to look for creative alternatives. Some people specialize in identifying problems. You know people like this. They specialize in identifying problems. A few people are good at finding solutions. Some people specialize in identifying problems. A few people are good at finding solutions, but real success in life comes from the ability to identify opportunities. And we need to view our challenges as opportunities. I love this quote, life is full of opportunities cleverly disguised as insoluble problems. 
Boy, I like that. Life is full of opportunities, cleverly disguised as insoluble problems. Be committed to a creative alternative. You know, when you run into a, 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 a bad place in, in, in the road, sometimes you need to get counsel from your pastor. Get a strategy. Uh, get a plan. Uh, seek the Lord diligently. And, and, and you will be, be rewarded. So be committed to a creative alternative. Number five, to reconcile quickly in the home, be tactful. Be tactful. That's why in verse 29 it says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Let no putrid, rotten communication come out of your mouth. I was growing up and my family, we lived on a farm in Southside, Virginia, and we had a big field of Irish potatoes every year. And it fell to my brother and I in August after the vines had died to harvest the potatoes. We would put a horse-strong turning plow behind a two-cylinder John Deere tractor and we would go down the uh, row and if you hit it just right, theoretically, uh, the potatoes would just fall right out and all you had to do was pick them up. Well, we were harvesting this huge crop of potatoes and uh, I noticed a potato that was lodged in the side of, of the hill that uh, it didn't fall out. It was just lodged there. So I reached down to pick it up. Well, it was about the size of a baseball. And when I picked it up, I immediately noticed it was an unstable potato. I mean, it was liquefied inside, but the skin was still intact. I used to play baseball in high school. I looked at that uh, unstable potato. I looked at my brother, and uh, he saw what was coming, so he took off and began to run. And I took that uh, rotten potato, that liquefied potato, and I threw that potato and hit my brother dead in the back. Man, that skin burst open and that rotten potato just uh, just burst out all over him. Is there anything more putrid, more corrupt, more rotten than a rotten potato? Man, after he had thrown up his lunch, he threw some fist in my direction for hitting him with that putrid uh, potato. And the Bible says, don't let any putrid, rotten, Com communication, no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Be tactful. Thomas Manton said, most of a man's sins are in his tongue. Most of a man's sins are in his tongue. You know, there's very few sins you commit uh, where the tongue doesn't get involved at some point. And uh, that's why we've got to learn how to be tactful. Some of us are very direct. I can't help being direct, but... Uh, I need to learn how to be tactful, and we all do. Uh, there was a man and his wife taking a trip, driving out in the country, and the wife fell asleep. Well, she finally woke up, and she said, we're lost. And the husband said, yes, but we're making excellent time. Well, the next two hours, they spent arguing and fussing and pouting, and finally they passed by this field. They didn't know where they were at, and they passed a mule, over in the field, and the husband said, is that a relative of yours? And the wife said, yes, by marriage. Oh, brother, uh, that, was a, that was a long trip, and there was some rotten communication going on there. But the Bible says, hey, don't let corrupt communication come out of your mouth. You know, the stronger we feel about something, the louder we get. And the louder we speak, often the less they hear. So, the more you speak, the more likely you're to say things that shouldn't be said in the abundance of words that wanteth not sin. Listen, the uglier the words, the less real communication. Somebody said it takes two years for a child to learn how to speak and 50 years to learn how to keep quiet. I'm not sure that 50 years is enough for some of us. But listen, if your brain is in neutral, Make sure your mouth is not in high gear. If your brain is in neutral, make sure your mouth is not in high gear. Pay attention to what you say. Pay attention to how you say it. Let, let, let no unwholesome speech, let no unwholesome words proceed out of your mouth. Doesn't the Bible say a soft answer turns away wrath? So it's important to use proper wording. 
Now look, when we're addressing one another, well, our children or our parents or our siblings, we need to understand that accusations harden the will. Accusations harden the will, but questions convict the con conscience. Remember Jesus when they brought that woman taken in adultery and uh, they were accusing her and he just wrote things in the sand. Accusations harden the will, but questions convict the conscience. Maybe he was writing down the sins they were guilty of or the people they had been involved with. I don't know, but I know this is true, that when you attack somebody with an accusation, uh, they bristle up and it hardens the will, but questions can convict the conscience. So seek clarification. You know, Nathan uh, gave the story of that rich man with all those animals to David who had confiscated the one poor man's lamb and that story absolutely broke David. Those words from Nathan the prophet spoke to his heart, convicted his conscience. Listen, be tactful. Now, if we want to learn how to resolve conflict in the home and reconcile quickly, number six, stop grieving the Holy Spirit. Stop grieving the Holy Spirit. Verse 30 of our text says, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God. Hmm. Stop distressing the Holy Spirit. Stop bringing heaviness to the Spirit of God. Now listen, when you're under the control of the Holy Spirit, the carnal fight has been taken out of you. Now how do we grieve the Holy Spirit? Well, with unforgiveness, obviously, with unthankfulness. And when we remain unreconciled, we're grieving the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says, don't grieve the Spirit of God. You've read there in 1 Peter chapter 3, where it says, Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. And these directives for the wives. And then it says to the husbands, Dwell with your wives according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel, that your prayers be not hindered. Do you realize that conflict in the home hinders our prayer life, hinders our walk with God, that our division in the home hinders our relationship with the Lord? And that's why we've got to work at having a Holy Spirit-saturated home by putting things right when things have gone wrong. Now look, when you surrender your rights to the Lordship of Christ, you're easy to live with. And when I'm under the control of the Holy Spirit, I'm easy to live with. We all are. So we need to learn to honor the Holy Spirit. Listen to the promptings of the Spirit of God and obey the Spirit checks that He puts upon your soul. Have you ever been talking uh, with some people and all of a sudden uh, there's this urge in you to spout off something you have heard or something that you know about somebody else that's that's not complimentary, not complimentary, it's negative. And, and you're just wishing they would be quiet so you could uh, uh, put in your two cents. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, don't say that. Keep your mouth closed. Do you ever have this? That's a prompting. That's a check of the Holy Spirit. And when you learn to not grieve the Holy Spirit by being quiet when the Spirit of God tells you to, to clam up. And sometimes you just got to do this and keep our mouths closed. When we listen to the Holy Spirit and when we obey the checks from the Holy Spirit, our homes will be happier places. You know what we all need? We need a PhD in repentance. Uh, earned doctorate in repentance. The Bible says if we walk in the light as he is in the light, uh, we will live a lifestyle of repentance, turning back to the Lord, turning to the Lord, turning from the wrong thing, but turning to the Lord. And you know, we shouldn't defend our wrong actions. We, we really shouldn't. We should humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and humble ourselves before one another because only by pride comes contention. Only by pride comes contention. And as we learn to humble ourselves and walk a lifestyle of repentance and humility before God, I'll tell you what, we're not grieving the Holy Spirit and the Holy Spirit saturates the atmosphere in our homes and that's what we want. Well, number seven, here's another guideline to reconciling quickly. Keep it private. Keep it private. 
Uh, verse 31 says, let all bitterness and wrath and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Let all bitterness and wrath and uh, evil speaking be put away. Stop advertising your frustration. Don't openly embarrass your spouse. Don't use sarcasm and never wash your dirty laundry in public. You know, when you go public, you're looking for pity. When you start talking about these problems to other people, you're looking for pity, but what you're doing is causing resentment. So don't down talk your mate to other people. Put away all bitterness. Don't entertain bitter thoughts. Uh, don't do evil speaking, bitter talk to other people. Put off all of these things. Keep it private. You know, the only people you ought to talk to about your problems are people who can help you solve your problems. So keep it private. And then number eight, uh, to have a happy home and reconcile relationships, we need to learn how to restore our relationships. Now, verse 32, boy, what a tremendous verse. Be ye kind to one another, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God, for Christ's sake, has forgiven you. Be kind. Hey, ask God to show you ways to be kind. You know, when there's been a wound, there needs to be careful treatment. That's why the Bible says, be tenderhearted, forgiving one another, be compassionate. You know, time does not heal all wounds, but it does take time for wounds to heal. Time does not heal all wounds, but it does take time for wounds to heal. So seek to be a peacemaker. We've got to work at the I am level of communication in our homes. The, the down deep, from the heart, the who we are, uh, the I am level of communication. And the marriages that work are the ones that people work at. The families that are happy are the ones who have learned to resolve conflicts. Now, conflicts are inevitable, but conflicts are solvable. And we can uh, use these guidelines to help heal and to resolve conflicts. Be honest. Be real. Speak the truth in love. Learn to control your anger. Of course, you're going to have uh, these things rise up in your heart, but learn to, to control your anger. Be angry, but sin not. Use right timing. Use wisdom. Uh, to resolve things. And uh, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. Number four, use a creative alternative. You know, if, uh, if you've been stealing, uh, start working with your hands. If there's something wrong in the home, put that off, but put on uh, something to replace it, a positive replacement. Number five, be tactful. Hey, learn how to be tactful. You know, some of us are so direct in our communication, but we can learn to have humility and be tactful. Number six, stop grieving the Holy Spirit. Oh, stop distressing the Spirit of God in the home, man. Uh, we want an ungrieved atmosphere in our homes. Keep it private and restore your relationships. Do you know you can work in making your home a happy place by celebrating victories daily? You know, when my wife and I would travel in churches, we would see people who weren't getting along. But, but brother, we determined that we wanted our home to be such a happy place that when our children grew up and got older, they would want to return to our home. And I'm telling you, you can use these principles of keeping the lines of communication open, to keeping a happy, positive, celebrative type atmosphere in the home to where there's unity and your family stays together. So uh, I would say this, that uh, what part of this message spoke most to you? And are there actions that need to be taken in your family uh, to make your home a happier place? I know the pastor is going to lead you in a season of implementation, and I trust you'll pray together, and, and we'll join here again tomorrow night for another session in the Home Improvement Conference. God's blessings on you as you pray and implement. Pastor Shumate, God bless you as you give direction. Looking forward to tomorrow night. Well, again, I want to thank you for watching tonight. Uh, what a blessing. Uh, what a blessing tonight. Uh, I asked myself a question as he was talking and, and uh, finishing up the, the lesson tonight. And 
and what part, and he asked the question himself, uh, what part of the message spoke uh, to, to me uh, mostly. And uh, I'll have to say it'd be easier for me uh, to, to say what uh, part of the message didn't speak to me. It'd be easier for me to, to list that because uh, there'd be practically very little that really didn't speak to my heart. Um, I hope it touched you. Uh, one of the biggest problems that we have in, in people's life is, um, especially when it comes to uh, marriage, is uh, reconciling problems and differences. And tonight, as we've heard the truth from God's Word, I want to challenge you uh, not only to just to listen to what uh, uh, Brother, Brother Harold has spoke tonight, but more than that, let God and let His Word help you to be able to take the truth that we've been given tonight and apply that to our life. Can I tell you, I am convinced tonight that what we have heard tonight through the teaching of God's Word is um, a sound doctrine. And it's so sound doctrine that any two people who are saved by the grace of God that would apply these eight guidelines, these principles for resolving conflicts, that it would eliminate divorce uh, amongst saved people. If we as God's people would apply these truths and the things that we've been taught thus far in this meeting. I think it would help us all to understand reconciliation is an important part of marriage. It's a biblical term, and it is exactly what we needed to hear tonight. What spoke to me? Well, a lot of different things. Uh, I jotted down as he was teaching. Uh, he said a perfect home is a place where imperfect people uh, are honest about their imperfection and they work to maintain peace. And that is very true. And uh, we, we need to do that. We need to work, and it is work, to maintain the peace. And uh, we need to reconcile when we have differences. Shepherding your family uh, and, and doing that honestly and... Uh, I thank God for, for what's been taught tonight. Don't remain angry. Control your anger. Learn to control that. And then he said conflicts in the home hinders our prayer life. And it does. You're, you're not going to be able to walk into the throne room of God when you are not. Uh, when you're out of kilter with, with your wife or husband, uh, the two shall be one flesh. So we know that uh, we're not going to be right with God when we're wrong with each other. So you see tonight, all these things combined, as we think about the teaching, what we have heard is so important, and it'll help us all as we think about that. Another great thought he brought up is honoring the Holy Spirit, and it'll make us easy to live with when we honor the Holy Spirit. So uh, I imagine that that'll be a new uh, phrase that some of our wives can use is, honey, you need to honor the Holy Spirit, and that will make you easy to live with. Amen? And I like that. Being tactful. That's one of the things, and, and I can speak for myself sometimes, I lack in that, and, and I need to improve in that, and some of you do as well. Uh, I like the, the thought conflicts are inevitable, but uh, conflicts are solvable. And that is true. With the help of God, any kind of conflict can be resolved and should be resolved as quickly as possible. The Bible teaches us, and he used the verse, don't let the sun go down upon your wrath. In other words, get it resolved, get it fixed up. So what a blessing tonight. I do appreciate what we've heard tonight. Man, what a message tonight. Great Bible teaching, great truth. And if we'll take those principles, these eight things, and apply them to our lives as individuals, we'll see a change in our life. Amen? And we'll see a change in our home. We'll see a change in our relationship. So application, what did the message speak to you? I want you to discuss that. Maybe you and your wife, and ma'am, uh, maybe you and your husband could discuss it. And maybe even the children can discuss what it was that spoke 
to you tonight through this message. Are there actions that need to be taken in your home? That's a good question. And that's for you to resolve. That is for you to decide. And I'm going to tell you tonight, uh, it would help you tonight if there is changes that need to be made. Go ahead and make them. Begin tonight and begin the process of making these changes. Well, I appreciate that. And uh, tonight, I'm going to have a word of prayer. We're going to close out with prayer tonight. But after I pray, I want you to join hands as a family, husband and wife, uh, with your children. Or if you're alone, I just want you to pray uh, uh, by yourself. But I want you to ask God to help you tonight as we pray together. Help us to take these truths, these eight principles, and apply them to our life. It'll do a lot of good if we'll only do it. I believe it's biblically sound. I think it is doctrinally correct. And I thank God for the word of God. And I appreciate Brother Vaughn preaching tonight. What a blessing. And I hope you'll be back tomorrow evening as we meet here again tomorrow night, 7 p.m. right here. Uh, just uh, log back in at 7 o'clock and Brother Vaughn will come on again with a recorded video. And then I'll be here after the video is over and then we'll give you some thoughts as we close out. So the Lord bless you tonight and I appreciate you tuning in. I hope you have a good day tomorrow. We'll see you tomorrow evening.